Later, the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Jesus saw through their hypocrisy and said, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. When they handed it to him, he asked, whose image and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply completely amazed them. Please read with me James chapter 1 verses 17 through 18. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This is the word of God for the people of God. <laughs> That's what happens when we uh, get a little out of practice doing things a little differently. I had not uh, put the little tag line down at the bottom of the scripture reading for Delinda today. So uh, she knew there was something. So I'll take uh, responsibility for that. It's astounding that this is November already, isn't it? A year has just flown by, and we've had a wonderful month of Christival, and now we are entering into our annual November Thanksgiving and Stewardship series of sermons. Uh, I think most churches I have been in throughout my life have done something along these lines in November. Certainly we have here uh, at Trinity since I have uh, been here, this being my third December. The sermon series this year is entitled, Giving to God What is God, which comes from the scripture passage that Delinda read for us this morning of Jesus saying, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, to God what belongs to God. And so today we'll be looking at the foundation for this sermon series and indeed the foundation for life, which is we belong to God. And then over the next three weeks we'll look at making the most of our time remembering that we belong to God. We'll discover and use our abilities, remembering that we belong to God. And then we will reach our conclusion or our climax to this stewardship time where we will look at how much we are to give God. Look at our financial responsibilities as we're looking ahead to funding God's mission here at Trinity for the year to come in 2020 and the years beyond. Who we belong to, this question of who owns us or what owns us controls everything. That's why I called it the foundation to the, certainly the series of sermons and indeed to living life. I'll go ahead and jump ahead because the sermon title does it, We Belong to God. And we're going to find that there is a paradox in that. We may think that we should belong to ourselves, or maybe we belong to our spouse, or maybe we belong to our family. Maybe we belong to groups, our country, our mater, the like, our church. 
reality is we don't belong to ourselves or to any of those things. We belong to God. And when we realize that truth, we are freed to trust God to provide for us as his loved possession. And we are freed to share those blessings with others. So who we belong to and realizing that controls everything. I just mentioned that this idea of belonging permeates much of our life. And we want to belong to something. We want to be a part of something. This is part of our being created to relate. But at the same time, it's pretty popular these days to find freedom in belonging to no one but ourself. Being our own person, caring only about ourselves. I looked at a number of blogs in preparing this week, and one was a short essay by a writer who told the story of being at a party during a time when she was not married, during a time when she was not attached to anyone, while most women in this group were. And a woman to her, and the writer introduced herself. They shook hands, and the woman asked Emily, who do you belong to? All the other women were appalled, Emily says, but says, I didn't feel bad about it at all. I replied, no one. I belong to myself. Another idea of belonging to self slightly differently. They said, long and short, I believe we belong to ourselves first. The most important relationship we will have is the one that we have with ourselves. I belong to one among many treading on earth, and to whom I belong, I belong first and foremost to myself, period. And lastly, I don't belong to what or to things. Instead, I make my life about the things I believe and stand for. So I ask, who do you think that you belong to? Because who we belong to determines everything. If we think we belong to ourselves, then we take responsibility for everything and such a yoke, such a burden that is to be in charge of not only our own life, but everyone else's around us. So who do we belong to? That really is what Jesus addressed in today's text. That simple question, who do we belong to? Today's text is a very well-known one. Those of us who've been in church most of our lives have heard it many times. It appears in three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's one of the very widely known stories. It's not uncommon to hear this story during stewardship emphases when oftentimes we're talking about priorities or about giving. But I want to go beyond that today. Those are all legitimate lessons to learn from the passage, but Jesus was really teaching a much deeper principle. And let me stress, Jesus was teaching a principle. Jesus was answering a specific question that was asked of him. And Jesus was giving us a principle to guide us. But Jesus wasn't giving us some cookie-cutter approach that determines precise, detailed answers to everything. He was giving us this principle of who we belong to. So picture 
with me what's going on. Jesus has just come into the city of Jerusalem a couple of days earlier riding on a donkey. This is what we call Holy Week. He has had his Palm Sunday. He's come in to Jerusalem and he's preparing to go to the cross at the end of the week. And he's teaching in the temple. And he has told the parable that we'll reference in a minute, the parable of the wicked tenants. And that parable upset the religious leaders. And so they left trying to figure out how can we get Jesus, and that's where today's text picks up. They send some Pharisees and some followers of Herod, religious leaders and political leaders, to try and trap Jesus with what they think is an unanswerable question. He's darned if he does and darned if he doesn't. They come to him and say, oh, wise teacher. And notice the irony of the story. They call Jesus wise and impartial and not showing favoritism in a sarcastic manner, yet everything they speak about Jesus is true. And they ask Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes? We could ask the same question today. We have religious liberty in our country. We worship only God, not the government. Is it lawful to pay taxes? And Jesus said, you hypocrites, you're trying to trap me. Give me a coin. And so they bring him a Roman coin. This is Actually, probably something very similar to the coin that they brought Jesus. Sometimes known as a tribute penny. It is also known as a denarius. The New Testament denarius, the writers tell us, represented one day's wages for a laborer. So imagine Jesus surrounded these Pharisees and political leaders and probably outside the group other people, perhaps some curious about this man who rode in on a donkey that they proclaimed. And Jesus is holding a coin that they gave him and he says, whose picture is on it? That's Tiberius up on the screen. And they answer him, Caesar's, the kings, the emperors, God's, our God. That's God with a little g, the divine emperor. That's his picture on the coin. And so Jesus, the truthful one, the impartial one, God's son, God in the flesh with everyone waiting with bated breath is asked, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? He doesn't say yes or no. He says, looking at the coin, whose image is on the coin? Whose likeness? The answer, Caesar's. Jesus says, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give back to God what is God's. That may be perplexing. What is Jesus saying to give back to God? But this word image that Jesus used, or that Mark uses in recounting Jesus, is the very same word as the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. We call the Old Testament says, God says, let's make humans in our image. Jesus is saying, in effect, 
give back material things bearing Caesar's image to Caesar and human beings who bear God's image owe God back themselves. God created humans in God's image and likeness and we as humans owe ourselves back to our Creator. We just finished Christival where we celebrated the arts and we talked about creativity in my last reflections. Think of a potter who is sculpting a piece of pottery and they create the pottery a beautiful piece of art perhaps even a beautiful artistic useful item a picture or a vase or a plate or a bowl the creator owns that piece of pottery doesn't he or she Jesus is saying, you are created in God's image and you belong to your Creator. But God's ownership of us goes deeper than that. For you see, God paid the cost of our sin with Jesus' life. Human beings were created in God's image. Human beings were created by God to relate with God, with each other, with all of God's creation in God's perfect plan, and we blew it with our sin. We rebelled, turned our nose on God our Creator, turned our backs on the one who created us, the one to whom we belong, the one who wanted perfect harmony with us, and broke that relationship. God had a plan, however, to heal that relationship, and God paid the cost of our sin with Jesus' life. I chose that word carefully because God's payment isn't simply the upcoming Friday where Jesus is hanging on the cross, but it's Jesus' entire life living incarnate in the flesh as God on earth, culminating in his death, demonstrating the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate love of all, and then empowered by his resurrection on Sunday. This paid the cost for our sin and our rebellion. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul puts it this way, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, within you, which you have from God, God the Creator, and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, the price of Jesus' life. Therefore glorify God in your body. Titus 2 says, He, Jesus, gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and here's the key, to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. The New Living Translation from which Delinda read gives the most literal translation to the word that King James says, render to. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, unto God what is God. What we read today is give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give back to God what belongs to God. We are to give ourselves back to God who created us and who brought us back to him as his possession through Jesus Christ. And notice that he brought us back, according to Titus, to make, his very, make us his very own people committed to doing good deeds.
Before we move on to this idea of being God's people committed to good deeds, and the third point in our bulletin about how God is remaking God's people, how he's remaking us into the image and likeness of Christ, let's remember the context that Jesus was in when he was confronted by the Pharisees and by the political leaders who supported Herod. <coughs> Remember, as I said, this is his last week on earth, and Mark chapter 12 gives a series of encounters between Jesus and religious and political leaders. The very first encounter he has, he tells a parable about wicked tenants. Basically, a lord, a master, owns a vineyard, and he leaves, and he leaves it in charge of the tenants. Who owns the vineyard? Not the tenants. The lord and the master. They are working it. They're going to get a share of wages, a share of return for their efforts, but the lord, the master, owns the fruits, owns the grapes, from the vineyard, he sends back representatives to collect his share that he owns, and the tenants say no. They beat the messengers, they throw out the messengers, they say forget it. So Jesus is talking about this principle of ownership and God's ownership. The story right after Jesus and the Roman coin, and the question about is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, is also brought in an attempt to trick Jesus or to twist him. It's the Sadducees, and they bring an unsolvable riddle to Jesus. The writer points out that the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in life after death, but guess what? They have a question about resurrection that they don't believe in. And it's a funny riddle. In fact, I mean, yeah, I, I saw a few of you kind of smile at this quandary that they're asking, the irony that they're asking a question about resurrection they don't even believe in. That's good. You could smile and you can laugh. Because the riddle is funny too. They say, Lord, there's seven brothers. Brother number one marries a wife, and he dies having no children. Moses told us that when that happens, the next brother is supposed to marry her and have children, not for himself, but for the deceased brother. So brother number two does that. He dies, no children. Guess what? Brother number three comes along, brother number four comes along, brother number five comes along, brother number six comes along, brother number seven comes along. No children, they're all dead, and the wife dies. <laughs> God, when they're resurrected, who does she belong to? And yes, I chose that word correctly. Remember, wives belonged to their husbands. They were little above property at that time. This is an ownership question. They're saying, who does she belong to? And Jesus says, you misunderstand Scripture, and you misunderstand God's power. God will handle who she belongs to, because in the resurrection, we're not going to be given away in marriage and so forth. We're going to belong to who? Our Creator God, in whose presence we are in heaven. But you don't understand scripture either because God isn't the God of the dead. When he told Abraham, I'm the God of, or told Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, he was saying, I am, not I was. Therefore, God is living and God's people are living. There is a resurrection. Story of ownerships that we have. Finally, a scribe hears Jesus and comes to him and asks, Lord, and he's asking sincerely, what is the greatest commandment? 
Remember, Jesus has just said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. He says it in a different way. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. With all of your being, give back to your Creator, the one whose image you bear. Give back your all. And love your neighbor as yourself. The neighbor who also belongs to God, who also bears God's image. And in this question of ownership and ultimate loyalty, concludes the chapter, chapter 12 of Mark, with what we call the story of the widow's might. Where a widow comes, gives two small coins, places it in the treasury, and Jesus commends her because she gave all she had, recognizing the one to whom she belonged, trusting God to provide for her. So since... God created us since Jesus came, lived, died, and was resurrected, paying the price for our rebellion. We belong to God. And as God's loved possession, God is remaking each believer in the likeness and image of God. Romans 8, 29 says, For God knew his people in advance. He chose them to become like his Son or as some translations say, to be conformed to the image of his Son. So we were created in the image of God, and now after our rebellion through Jesus Christ and the gift of God's grace, God is remaking us into God's own image, the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So when we are made in Christ's image, we are made, remade in God's image. Colossians 3 says, But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off the old self, the sinful self, the rebellious self, and put on a new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator, Jesus Christ. We belong to God. God, our original creator. God who paid the price of our rebellion to bring us back to himself, and the God who is remaking us in God's image, conforming us to act in a godlike manner. As I was preparing this sermon, and I got to the James passage, I realized that that simple verse, James 1.17, and really continuing into verse 18, could be a sermon in and of itself. I'll keep it short this morning to wrap it up. But we've, we've laid the groundwork of Jesus and the coin and the imagery of God in us, God paying a price for our rebellion, God remaking us. But James is facing a similar congregation. He knows that God owns the followers, that his congregation belongs to God. But they're suffering hardship and they don't really know how to deal with this idea of belonging to God, an all-powerful God, and yet bad things happen. And they're struggling with tests. They're struggling with temptations to do wrong. They're struggling with where is God in the midst of all of this persecution 
and his difficulty. And James says, Do not be deceived, for every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change. Every good thing, every good gift, every act of giving comes from God. Whether it comes literally from God through miracles, whether it comes literally from God through His creation, or whether it comes down from God through God's people, spreading God's love and God's blessing. All that we have, all that we are, all that we will ever have or ever be comes from God, not from us. If you think you've earned anything you have, you're fooling yourself. For you belong to God. God bought you back with a price. And God is remaking each of us as believers back into God's image, Jesus Christ. And every good thing comes from God. The corollary to that, and James talks about it in different words, but nothing bad comes from God either. Evil's in the world. But God gives us good things, and one of the good things that James stresses God gives us during times of adversity is the wisdom to deal with the adversity, the wisdom and the ability to deal with the bad things that happen. And sometimes... That ability may come from, guess who? Those around us, our friends, our family, our churchgoers, other persons made in the image of God, being remade in the image of God. James continues in verse 18 to explain that all good things come from God to fulfill his own purpose. And in his purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth. God's literal word of truth. But I suspect James is also playing on this Greek idea of logos, word. That is the overall controller of the universe. To whom John refers when he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the Word, has always been. So in fulfillment of God's purpose, he gave us birth through Jesus, the Word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, as I promised, we could dig deeply into that text and where it leads, but all that matters for today is we belong to God. God created us in God's image. When we broke that imagery, when we broke that relationship, God paid the price to bring us back into relationship with Him. God is remaking us into God's image, the image of Christ, and He's doing it so that we can be His people so that we can become, as James puts it later in his book, doers of the word. I'll close with one thought and then we'll examine what does all of this mean for us. One of the big things that James is concerned about in his book are words. Speech. James recognizes that speech can be harmful. If you have any doubt, just look around our world today. We have politicians calling each other names. We have family members calling each other names. We have churches splitting and dividing, calling each other names. We have businesses breaking up, calling each other's names. We have marriages breaking up, calling each other names. We live in a vicious, mean-spirited, evil-speaking world, kind of like the world James lived in. And James says, be aware of the power of your words. 
and those who are remade in the image of God, in the image of Jesus Christ, should be kind and generous and giving in their words. We shouldn't be mean and hateful because we belong to God. God nurtures us, God gives us gifts, and God provides direction for our lives. I told the story of Jesus being approached by the scribe and asked about the greatest commandment for a reason. You may have said that doesn't really sound like it fits this idea of giving or this idea of ownership when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that only makes sense that we give ourselves back to our maker. But Jesus continues and says, not only do you owe your worship and yourself to God, your creator, but you owe yourself and your effort to God's creation who also bear God's image, who also belong to God, their creator, your neighbor, who you're supposed to love. And we can do that by cultivating a lifestyle of gratitude, which is what we're doing in this month of Thanksgiving. If we recognize that alone we are nothing, without Jesus we're nothing, without God we have nothing, not even life, much less the good things, because all good things come to us. When we recognize that, we can thank God for everything. The doxology does it when it says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Another old hymn talks about this lifestyle of gratitude, saying that we should count our blessings and what? Name them one by one. Henry Emerson Fosdick once observed that in his experience, those who reflect on their lives and conclude that they've received less than they deserve tend to be among those from whom no great living comes. They spend all their time being victims. Poor pitiful me. Others evaluate their lives, think they have broken about even, and conclude, yeah, I got what I earned. I got what I deserved. I'm happy. Rarely do you see any exceptional living from them either. However, those who readily reckon they've received far more than they deserve, who are grateful for what they have been given that they don't deserve are among those who indulge in great living. God supplies the good things in our lives and from this basic affirmation we are to go about living our daily lives by giving generous acts, small gifts, gestures and words to others in our everyday life in gratitude for the gifts that our Creator, our Remaker, our Sustainer gives us. Jesus teaches that we're to give back ourselves because we belong to God. And the alternative is to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Caesar in Jesus' day was a literal ruler, literally the government, but for us, it is any lesser power than God who might hold claim to our lives, who might claim our allegiance, our heart, our soul, our mind, or our strength. Those are the Caesars that we're to resist by giving to God what is God's. Let's remember, though, that sometimes God's image is hard to recognize. We may look in a mirror not feeling particularly good about ourselves and not see God's image, but it's there. We were created by God in God's image, and those of us who believe are recreated by God in God's image. And when we look at those around us, we should remember they too 
bear the image of God, and Jesus calls us to love them as we love ourselves. All that we have, all that we are, come from God. When we recognize this reality that we belong to God, we're allowed to trust God to provide all that we need, and we are free to share God's blessing with others. Let's pray. Creator God, Lord God, Sustainer God, thank you. Help us to remember it is you to whom we belong. It is you to whom we owe ultimate loyalty. But because we are your loved possession, you provide every good thing that we need. Not because we deserve it, not because we're entitled to it, but because we need it. And by being blessed by you, we can share with others, being your hands and feet in meeting their needs too. All in the image of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.